Hey everyone, it's Dr. Namani and Dr. Louie back again today with the Athlete Spine, and we're really excited to have Dr. David Skaggs, who's a world-renowned spine surgeon, who is the co-director of Cedar sinai Spine in Los Angeles here with us today to talk about a topic that we've uh, talked a little bit about previously uh, on a couple different episodes, and that is spondylolysis and PARS defects in athletes. So welcome, Dr. Skaggs. Dr. Namani, Dr. Louie, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Yeah, so th this is always a fun topic, and it's one that's like near and dear to a lot of people, both sort of the athletic population, the older population, and, and especially to the parents uh, that have children who have back pain in these sports. So I guess one of the first questions we have for you is, how do you figure out that there is a fracture in the spine in the region? Yeah. Of like, how do they present to you, and, and what are the common complaints you hear early on, especially from the younger population? Yes, that's a great question because right now, I mean, like 50% of 15 year olds have back pain. Yep. So, how do you know it's from a spondy? Now, at the same time, 6% of the population has a spondy. Most people don't even know they have one. And most people, it's not their source of back pain. So, mm -hmm. it's very easy, I think, to get misled or to miss things here. Um, and I'd say it you know, goes back to a lot of just clinical medicine. If it hurts specifically when somebody bends backwards and they're pointing around L5, it is a posterior element fracture until proven otherwise. If it hurts all over, welcome to adulthood. Yeah. And if it hurts when you bend forwards, you know, think of something else. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that the clinical picture is what should really drive us to think that the spondy is not only there, but it's what's causing the pain. Mm -hmm. No. And, and, you know, obviously people present to not only you, but also to various other doctors, including their primary care doctors or to urgent care, you know, with, with back pain that if it's from a spondylolysis, like you said, is in, in extension, when do you start to think about getting any sort of imaging studies and how do you counsel these patients? Let's say if they've only had two weeks of symptoms in terms of what things initially they can do to try to, to treat this conservatively. Yes, I, that's a great question. If someone comes in with two weeks of back pain, you know, I think it's reasonable to get a EOS image because it's almost no radiation. You know, why not standing up, PA lateral, you know, feel like a jerk if you missed a grade five spondy. You know, so why not just image and make sure we're not missing anything obvious? But I don't think we should do anything more than that at two weeks, as long as, you know, there's no numbness, tingling, weakness, pee in your pants, wake up in the middle of night of pain, as long as they can jump up and down on each foot three times, walk on their heels, you know, popliteal angles are reasonable. You know, if everything else is kind of normal, you have two weeks of back pain, we've all been there. You know, don't overreact, don't get the CT or MRI, give it some time. And it's, you know, parents laugh when I say this, but like, don't do anything that hurts, you know, use common sense. It's tough for a teenage boy. It's tough for a six-year-old man, <laughs> but try not to do what hurts. Give it some time. The human body heals itself. Cer certainly easier said than done. So yeah. let's say it's been going on for more than a couple of weeks now. They've tried to go back to play. Again, I, guess, I think we're talking about sort of the adolescent here. Um, they have pain with extension, like we talked about, you know, they've gotten x-rays and, you know, nothing looks crazy, right? There's not a huge slip, you know, we can't see a frank fracture. When do you start saying, okay, let's get the MRI or let's get the CT or one or the other, or do you get both at the same time? Well, let's take a step backwards and this yeah. will be PowerPoints. The things we don't want to do are take oblique views. You know, the old days, people talked yeah. about oblique views and look at Scotty the dog. There's been good studies showing it doesn't help all it does is radiate the kid. Mm -hmm. The thing we also don't want to do is get flexion extension views. I have never once found that helpful in a young athlete. Now, what really gets me going sometimes is insurance companies demand that before you get an MRI. And that's mm -hmm. bad medicine. All you're doing is radiating a kid. Okay, so I got that off my chest. That's Thank important. You. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I generally go with an MRI first because it's no radiation and it might show us some surprising things. And it might also let us focus in. And I think that the most useful thing on the MRI is the sagittal stir sequence. And generally you see increased uptake in the pedicle. Now the unknown reader 
says, oh, there's something in the pedicle. I've seen hemangiomas red. I've seen pedicle fractures red. You know, the pedicle looks hot, but it's generally a spondylolysis, which is causing that. Now, I can go off even a little bit more. We did a study maybe 10 years ago that showed about 40% of the time the MRI official reading missed the spondy, you know, oh. using CT as a gold standard. We just completed that again for the last couple hundred patients we see. And there's still something like 25% of the official readings are missing the spondy on an wow. MRI. So, you know, MRIs really aren't that good at bone. Except, you ready for this? Have you guys heard of bone MRI? We, we have, yeah. It's a pretty, pretty exciting technology. Yeah, so I don't have any financial, you know, stick in this, but I think it really is a game-changing technology where at Cedars, what we do now is throw in one more sequence, sequence. It's about five minutes in the machine. And after they do mumbo jumble, hidden AI stuff, a CT comes out. And 90% of the time, the measurements on this bone MRI are within a millimeter of the CT itself. So it's pretty new. Uh, but at this point, we get the bone MRI in everyone. And frequently, that is enough to let us know there's a spondy, yes or no, and it's hot, yes or no. Now, the other thing I want to throw out, you know, when someone bends backwards, we say it's a posterior element fracture until proven otherwise. It could be a facet fracture. Mm -hmm. It's something that's not well known, um, but I've seen a lot of facet fractures in kids. It's a little broken bone in the joint. And if you just take it out, it's like taking a piece of sand out of their eye. The kid's like, oh my God, you fixed me. You know, you feel like yeah. Yeah. It's like a, yeah. And do you find that the mechanism of the facet fracture is similar to the mechanism of... I, I think I, so. It's yeah. hard to I'm trying to think of the forces in which you would, because it, yeah. it a compression of the joint or it's a sort probably, of odd axial load that's yeah. not quite. I mean, it's axial, probably a but... similar type of stress fracture. It's just that the stress exits at a slightly different point in the posterior elements rather than the pars just a little bit lower in the, in the, in the, in the, in the yeah. joint, maybe. I, mean, I think, like, let's say if you have an L5 spondy, I think the inferior facet of L4 is pushing down on it. Mm -hmm. and maybe Sometimes the inferior facet of L4 fractures. I'll try to send you a movie that would be pretty cool, you know, showing how that could happen for your viewers. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. Well, I think the uh, you know, the point that different imaging studies are good at looking for different things is important because, you know, oftentimes I have patients come in and they say, well, I already have an MRI. Isn't that the best kind of image you can get, you know? And the point is, I think that different types of imaging, whether that's x-rays or a CT scan or an MRI, look at different things well, but it's great now that we have these new technologies that allow us to take the information in an MRI and give us images that look like a CT scan, which you know historically has been the best type of image to, to image a spondylolysis. Yes. And, you know, and one of the things that helps us if we do the MRI first and we see L5 is hot and nothing else, maybe we can get a CT just of L5, yeah, right. especially in kids, we really want to minimize radiation at that part of the body. Yeah. 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 And then that's important to bring up is that we are so much more conscious about radiation exposures these days and the technology is allowing us to do so much more yeah. than what we've been able to do in the past, but it takes a concerted effort from both sort of innovation from industry, but also from us to say, well, how can we also help push this along to say, Hey, we need to protect our patients at all costs or else you're right. We're just zapping them all yep. the time. So, all right. So now they get some sort of image and it shows a fracture in the pars, right? And I, I, this is always a crossroad and we face it in our patients too. Um, what do we do next? You know, they're in the beginning of a season um, or they really want to play. Uh, they've heard stories of both surgery or resting and they've heard sort of benefits or risks of both, you know, what does your first conversation look like with them and their parents at this point? See, now it, the conversation totally depends on what type of spondy it is. You know, if it's a spondy that's eight, centim eight millimeters separated and it's not hot, there's no way you're going to heal that conservatively. You're not going to try to, you just say rest until you feel better and go back and play. Mm -hmm. You know, I imagine maybe some scar tissue is forming, who knows, but if you have a tiny like one millimeter crack and it's hot on MRI or increased signal, there's a really good chance this could heal. The problem is it might be two or three months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, you know, it's very, very individualized exactly what does the MRI and CT show for what discussion you're going to have.
Yeah. And I imagine it also depends on, you know, what kind of athlete the the, the player is, what level they play at, whether yep. they're being recruited for a college sports, you know, are they in season or out of season? Um, I think all of these things probably play into that decision making, right? Precisely. Yes. And, you know, recently I did a pro baseball player and, you know, in that sport, if you're out for a few seasons, you're out, you're never going to make it. Yeah. So we were more aggressive about putting a screw across him and he got back to play. You know, with uh, someone who's in eighth grade, of course, we'd say, no, stop, let's do everything we can conservatively. You right. know, eighth grade sports doesn't matter for recruitment, just like this is kind of a secret, but eighth grade grades don't matter. Forget oh. it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, uh, talk us through some of the the, the surgical treatment options. You know, um, you know, maybe we can touch on a little bit of what's been done historically, you know, for, for these types of injuries. Um, and then some of the newer minimally invasive techniques, you know, that, that are being done. You know, we talked, uh, we have a previous video uh, where we talked to Andrew Thomas, uh, you know, describing um, the procedure that he had. Uh, but talk to us a little bit, because you've written a lot about this and, and published some recent articles about some of the newer innovative uh, ways that you're fixing these. Yeah. And let me take one step back. If the disc is black and horrible and collapsed, then I think we should do a fusion, you know, say L5 across S1. But if the disc looks good, and then I think the best thing we can do is try to repair it. And the classic is putting in two pedicle screws and two rods and two upgoing hooks. And, you know, there's of course been a few different imaginations of this and rods and different shapes and things. And they all seem to do pretty well. There's the classic buck screw, an intralaminar screw. You know, they all seem to do fairly well when you look at the, you know, meta-analysis of many different studies, you know, but up until now, they've all pretty much been done open. Mm -hmm. you know? So the game changer for me coming here to Cedars three years ago is before I came here, I not only never used a robot, I never saw one. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm laughing that I've done my spine fellowship now. Um, and it's a total game changer that through a two centimeter incision or less, I can put in two perfect intralaminar screws. You know, I never thought I'd be doing outpatient pediatric spine surgery. <laughs> um, you know, while people love the idea and concept of a compression screw, I don't think we can rely on a compression screw to provide long-term compression. I, I'm, you know, still thinking about this. My preference is to use a HA coated screw yep. um, somewhere around six to 10 weeks, the HA coating grows in. And I think that that makes it the most solid thing out there. Thus far, my patience is kind of wild. Every kid I've done, right after the surgery, like, hey, that pain's gone. You know, the movement has stopped. Yeah. The problem is they're out surfing and playing sports weeks later. I'm like, oh, stop. We want to like, <laughs> you know, my, I tell them almost certainly you can go back by three months. Most of the time now we're doing a CT scan around eight weeks or so. And mm -hmm. then we can visualize the screws in the right place, haven't nailed the joint above or below, which is kind of important. Uh, and the bone is healed. Mm -hmm. Once we have uh, radiographic evidence that the bone is healed, let the kids go back full to sports. Oh, great. And and the CT scan you're getting is just focused to that specific level, I'm guessing, at this point. Great point. Yes, yeah. we want a very focused CT of one level only. And it's astounding how many times we write that, the parents ask for it, and they still oh. do the whole lumbar spine anyway. So that's the time yeah. when you say the parents have to be very uh, protective then. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been a great discussion. You know, last thing I want to ask is how do you then rehab these patients back? Do you think there's any, any um, uh, mechanical issues that predispose patients to this or any functional things that the patients can work on um, any me mechanics, you know, of, of let's say baseball pitchers or whatnot that may predispose to this, that you yeah. want to try to get people to focus on in the post-op period? Yeah, so it's, it's a big topic. You know, first off, this is somewhat genetic. You know, 37% of Eskimos have it. Yeah. You know, there's something genetic going on. Yeah. Uh, Ken Illingworth, my partner, has just done some great work showing that kids who get spondies, their pars is more horizontal and L4 is closer to hitting it, you yeah. know, and is subluxed in the joint. So I think there's, you know, people are at risk for this from a bony anatomic standpoint. 
And in a Division I pitchers, it's been shown that 17% of pitchers, even if they don't have back pain, they have something hot going on around L5. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think those activities do it. However, you know, if you're an elite athlete, if you're an elite gymnast, I think sending someone to PT to do core strengthening, I don't know how much that helps, to be honest. You know, I think that we all do it. I think we do it out of habit. We do it maybe so they don't call the doctor so much. So somebody else is doing something. Um, But I uh, honestly am not sure we need to do anything specific other than let them slowly return to sports. Mm -hmm. And I know I'll have a million people argue with me, uh, but I propose show me a study that shows that post-op physical therapy does better than not doing post-op physical therapy. You know, Mm -hmm. when you break your arm, you go into a cast and the bone heals. You know, does it? athlete need physical therapy after they have a broken bone in their arm why not yeah i mean in this patient population a lot of a lot of times we just tell them like this is the therapy of life right just go out there and live your life and sometimes there's no better therapy than that because right we get back to what we want to do right so just go out and do it and if for some reason there's a limitation or you're having trouble getting there maybe that's where therapy can be most beneficial, but we just want them to go back to what they enjoy and, and they will hopefully regulate themselves to a certain standpoint. And no, honestly, in these, in these athletes, if they're at a high level, probably working with the team yeah. athletic trainer, right. And probably better than a physical therapist. Yes. And you know, a lot of these kids, they're not sleeping enough. They have so much going on with homework, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, and practice and double sessions. You know, we don't want to throw an extra hour into the day. We want to yeah. let them sleep. We want to let them socialize. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Dr. Skaggs, this has been really fantastic. We really have enjoyed this conversation and and hearing about some of these new and innovative techniques for uh, treating what is a very common problem, uh, you know, as we've learned. So uh, thanks again for the discussion Uh, to everyone. Please like and subscribe and follow us on Instagram Uh, until the next time. See you later. Take care. Thanks again. Thank you for the opportunity. Have a great day.